Well, good afternoon and welcome to our first annual Claremont Garden History Lecture Series. We're very, very happy to have so many of you uh, come and join us today because we think this will be a wonderful talk. My name is Alice Stanley Durvin and I'm the principal here at Claremont Fancourt School. If you've had the opportunity to look around the house and grounds a little bit, I'm sure you'll agree that it is a wonderful, wonderful blessing for every one of us who work here and for the children who go to school here to um, just experience this, this environment every single day. We are all very aware that having this wonderful site brings with it the responsibility also to care for the house and the gardens. And our school is very, very much committed to making sure that we retain and restore and improve in keeping with the site. Um, so we've, we've done lots of work on it and will continue. You can see from the lines here that we're in the process of restoring this building, this room, um, to its, its grandeur. Um, we're also very committed to learning about our site because that's one of the ways, of course, that we improve and, um, and take care of it. And so we have the opportunity today to do just that. We're going to learn about historic gardens. I'd like to introduce David Regal. David and his wife, Barbara, have been the main organizers of this event, and we greatly appreciate their love for the school and their interest in historic gardens. And then David will introduce our speaker. Well, isn't this something? Um, you, uh, many of you probably have gotten an email from me, and I really appreciate seeing you here today. Um, welcome to what we hope to be at least an annual lecture on garden history. Um, Claremont, what a, what a place for us to sort of center ourselves as we carry on this conversation that we're hoping to have. And, and I think it, uh, how, this is just what I had in mind. Just what I had in mind. Um, you, some of you already know Professor Mole uh, of the University of Bristol. He's a popular and prolific author and speaker, well known to both garden history scholars and the public. His, un although garden history scholars often are part of the public. His ongoing project, Historic Gardens of England, supported by grants from the Levin Hume Trust is modeled after Sir Nicholas Pevner's Buildings of England. Upon completion, the nationwide project will present historic landscapes and gardens in separate texts, county by county. Ten books have already been published to date. Professor Mole is an engaging speaker with a long-standing interest in the cultural context of designed landscapes, the people who designed and lived in what are now considered historic buildings and gardens. We have a, afterwards, uh, uh, after uh, Professor Moll's talk, uh, we'll have a question and answer session, and we hope it's as lively as we can make it. Okay? Um, to keep thoughts, though, clear, I'm going to pass these cards around for you to make notes on, and if you'd like, write out questions, and then during the Q&A, we'll have them passed up. Okay? Now, you must be very careful with your questions, because we're being videoed, all right? And I shall have to be very careful with my language, won't I? Um, particularly as quite a few people in the audience have either been taught by me or are being taught by me, and it's lovely to see them. Um, but it's a great privilege for me to be here at Claremont, um, in a county that I haven't yet managed to deal with, although Jill Leggett's here in the audience, and we'll probably have a talk about things I could do in Surrey when I'm uh, finished the 34 others or the 33 others. Um, one of the big problems about this Levy Hume project that I'm doing is that um, I started far too late. Uh, Pevsner started in the 51, I think, and he finished England um, in 1974 with Staffordshire. But then, you know, he spent about six weeks doing each book in the first ones and I tend to spend about six or seven months doing each of mine. But now I'm very fortunate in that I have people to work with me, uh, funded by the Leverhulme, um, and so we're doing it a bit quicker, but not as quickly as I might like. Um, at the moment, I've got two books to write before Christmas. And 
teaching and everything. But that's great. That's what one wants to do. But this is, um, in true Blue Peter fashion, this is one I did earlier um, on um, William Kent. Um, it's brilliant, isn't it, doing uh, a biography of someone that you rather despise in many ways, um, or at least you think is a bit of a drunkard, um, not a terribly good architect, but quite a clever and intelligent gardener. Um, I'd done a couple of biographies before, one on Horace Walpole and one on William Beckford. Um, Walpole, um, I really disliked, uh, even though he was really quite an exciting um, commentator on the 18th century. But he was so, so bitchy. I mean, really bitchy bachelor. Um, and then, of course, I had Beckford. And, of course, Beckford was an absolute liar. Actually suggested that he'd done quite a lot of Mozart's little arias. And I wanted to call the book Composing for Mozart. A uh, Life of William Beckford, and of course the publisher wouldn't allow that. It had to be A Life of William Beckford, <laughs> composing for Mozart. But you know non puy and dry, don't you? Da, 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 da. Beckford claimed he'd actually done that, and not Mozart, but there we are. Um, with William Kent, it's quite difficult to pin him down. It's not difficult to pin him down in terms of landscape gardening, which is what we're here to look at today, but it's very difficult to pin him down in terms of his character because he left very few letters, and those letters that we have got are generally begging for money from Italy. Um, so it's very, very difficult to get his character um, dealt with. Anyway, let's... Yeah. Um, some of the slides in this presentation have got... Uh, quotes, which I will read out. Not all of them have, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, this is William Kent by Benedetto Luti, very heavy, jowly Kent, still in Italy in 1718 before he comes back to England. Um, and I love this Thomas Robinson quote. Robinson, nasty piece of work. Um, Yorkshireman, uh, dangerous person, Robinson. The signor, as he was called, often gave his orders when he was full of claret which from the context could hardly have been at the dinner table, and suggest therefore an all-day intake of alcohol. And he did not perhaps see the work for several months after. He had indeed a pretty concise, though arbitrary, manner to set all right. For he would order, without consulting his employers, three or four hundred pounds of work or more to be pulled down and then correct the plan and bring it to what it ought to have been at first. And this is absolutely typical of Kent. He's drunk a lot of the time. He's not quite sure in terms of architecture what he's doing and then goes into a fit of peak and wants to rebuild things. Um, we ought to give you a little bit about his history first. Um, one of the best books to have been written in the last 10 years is by Fiona McCarthy, and that's the biography of William Morris. I don't know if any of you have read it. Um, and the first thing that she says in that book, which is very much what I believe in, she says that you have to go to places to find the people. And I've had a wonderful tour of the house here with Pamela, um, thinking about all the people that have been in this house and have made this house what it is. Um, and so I thought, I've got to go to Bridlington. I'm going to switch sides, and I'll come back to you, don't worry. Um, but I like switching sides. Uh, oh, yes, coalition government, isn't it? Um, and I thought, I'm going to have a fun time in Bridlington. This is what research should be. And I am going to stay over, and I'll have a lovely time. So anyway, I go to Bridlington thinking, it's a lovely place on the East Riding Coast, and I'll have a great time. It's an absolute hellhole. Have you ever been to Bridlington? Goodness me. I've never seen so many shell suits in my life. Oh, dear. But Bridlington Old Town is wonderful. And that, of course, is where... William Kent grew up. His father, William Cant, C-A-N-T, um, lived in Bridlington Old Town, and this is where he probably went to school, at the Bale, on the left, at the Priory Church, and on the right, sorry, the left is the gatehouse of the Bale, where the grammar school was, and on the right is the Priory Church, where I think Kent might have got an inkling of the Gothic. Now, of course, the title of my lecture tonight is Subverting the Palladian, the Gothic urge, the, the eclectic urge. Um, and there are real heroes tonight and real villains. And one of the main villains tonight is Lord Burlington. And we'll come more to that. He's the guy that created a Palladian straitjacket for Kent that Kent was trying desperately to burst out of most of his life. 
Anyway, oh, I've got to go over here, haven't I, because it won't work unless I do that. Yeah. So off I go to old, old Town. I go to Bridlington, and I find this rather interesting late 17th century facade on one of the earlier houses. Um, and if you forget everything you hear tonight, don't forget this. Always trespass and always go round the back of buildings because that's where you find excitements. So I went round the back of this building through a little alleyway and I found the date stone that his father had put up. Can you see it's W-E, C-W-E and a little heart. And that's William Cant and his wife and a heart to show how together they were that he had done this facade in the 1690s. And then I looked down, and looking down, I saw this in the courtyard. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that's Kent. Now, you see, the whole point about being a biographer is you have to capture your subject. And I found it very difficult to capture Kent because of all of these rather odd letters that were written in bits of Italian and bits of English. Um, he, he had terrible dyslexia. There's no doubt about it, he was dyslexic. Um, and I looked at this, and a woman came out of the door, and she said, ooh, you like my name then, do you? And I said, yes, it's a wonderful name. And I said, it reminds me of William Kent. And she said, well, who's he then? I said, well, he lived in your house. Oh, did he? That man Kant? And I said, yes. I said, but when he went to London, he felt he had to be a little bit hoity-toity, and so changed his name to Kent. Oh, right. So we had this lovely chat. And then I started to look at William Kent's staffage. And there was the key to the man's mind. You only had to look at these wonderful drawings, most of them done in sepia, as you can see, for the garden buildings that he was designing for various people. On your right is um, one of the Chiswick designs for the obelisk and the gate in, in the gardens at Chiswick. And if you look very carefully, you can see that there is a man that's lolling in a drunken stupor, because of course it's midnight, and he has a pallet by him, and there are rabbits dancing in a circle. That's Kent, okay? Are you getting him? It gets better. Watch this. This is more Kent Staffage. It's great to have it up here. You can all see it, can't you? Who's got the popcorn? <laughs> On your top left, it's, you've got to work out who he is. And of course, nobody had actually worked out until I did this, this book who Kent was in all these drawings. And of course, the thing that's the giveaway is the staff. So Kent is always the man with the staff. So on your top left, you have Kent with his staff talking to one of the noblemen, which of course would be Burlington, and there is a little lapdog pissing on Burlington's ankle. Can you see that? And then on the right, there's Kent, just done a bit of designing in the garden, and he's taking a relief against the wall, and so is the dog taking a relief, <laughs> cocking his leg. And then who would actually design a cold bath, of course we've seen this fantastic cold bath here, the plunge bath, who would design a cold bath in, in the, in the terms of um, a Roman pantheon, which you can't see just out of shot, and actually have semi-naked men lolling about as if they're in some calidarium or frigidarium. And then on the right is the most important of all, Kent's staffage. And that is, as you can see, a satire kissing a shepherdess hand. Remember that. There'll be a test, okay? You're doing Q&A, I'm doing a test. Now, that gives you some idea of how you try and get into the mind of someone that I think probably did more than anybody to create this rather loosening of nature that went on in the 1730s on which that garden is symptomatic of. Um, also, don't let's forget Queen Caroline. Um, women have a terribly bad press, don't they, in the 18th century? They're rather dull people that do very little. They do sort of silhouettes, and they do um, rock and shell works in grottos, and that's about all they do. Not a bit of it. We need a lot more work done on women in the 18th century, and Caroline is absolutely central to what was going on in the gardens in the 1730s. But I'll come back to that. Um, first of all, I've got to try and explain this sort of weird thing that happened to Kent. When he's 15, he decides to go down to London. He doesn't want to become um, a joiner, uh, a, a cabinet maker, 
like his father, and he gets down to London, and he's within a circle of East Yorkshire lawyers, who of course have connections down in London, and he becomes a limner, someone that's actually doing legal documents and doing the decorations and uh, the calligraphy for legal documents. And someone spots him. We think it's probably a man called Burrell Massingbird. Most of the early letters are from Kent to Burrell Massingbird asking for money when he's in Italy. And they decide that he's going to be a second Raphael, which is a bit of a joke, really. And they're going to send him to Italy to become this great artist. Remember, artist. He's not at this stage an architect or a landscape designer or an interior designer, certainly not a garden building designer. He wants to become a painter, a history painter. And he goes to Italy, and he is taught by Giuseppe Chiari, um, who is a purveyor, basically, of uh, acceptable soft porn in Italy at the time. I mean, look at the left hand. You can see what I mean. It's very acceptable. It's usually got a mythological theme, and it's a good way of getting some bare breasts up on your wall. On your right is Kent Ditchley, particularly in Oxfordshire, where he was working in the 1720s when he came back from Italy. And you can see, if you look very carefully at it, that almost everything in the two Kent pictures up there are dead ringer copies for Chiari's work, but really bad copies. I mean, I have never ever seen a woman with um, a waist that wide. Have you ever seen a woman with a waist that wide at the top? And can you see how very similar the, ma the helmeted man is to the one in the Hokum picture? So Kent, Kent does all this copying while he's in Rome. But at the same time, we find out from these letters between him and Burrell Massingbird that he's actually very interested in odd things, in eclectic things, in things that aren't classical, in things that are nothing to do with art or painting. He raves about St. Peter's, sorry, Piazza in Venice. He raves about... Um, the Duomo at Siena. He, and he's interested in John Talman, who he's actually gone to Italy with, in all of the exciting designs and drawings that Talman is bringing back. Very Catholic and very eclectic. This is a Talman design for a Gothic hall for all souls, Oxford, that was never built. But you can see how weirdly eclectic it is. Um, so San Marco, the Duomo, um, and Talman's influence, Catholic influence on him, are great when he's in Italy. What he doesn't do is he doesn't see any of these. He's not interested in classical architecture. He's not interested in Palladian architecture. He's not going to be the man that's going to come back and be able to build Chiswick for Lord Burlington because he's not interested in architecture, certainly not in purist um, neoclassical architecture like these by Palladio. Come on, come on. Ooh. What he does do, and again, very few people know about this, is that he does this Church of the Flemings in Rome. And it's, uh, it's fresco work. It's extraordinary how you have an, English, an Englishman there trying to be an artist who can create this. Now, it's not very good, but in terms of the technique, it's quite brilliant for someone to be able to do this. So in 1718, he's already done this, St. Julian of the Flemings, in Rome. And then, comes back swaggering, back to London, dressed like this. Pamela's just shown me this. She's just got a picture of it for the school. And this is William Aitman's portrait, with those lovely red shoes, um, looking rather sort of fat around the waist and very self-satisfied. And then we have George Virtue. Now, you've got to be very careful of George Virtue because he's a chronicler of the arts of the age and he's a spiteful man as well. So you have to work, work with a pinch of salt with him. Mr. Kent became envied and admired above all for this noble lord's, that's Burlington, benefactions to him and interest and that of Lady Burlington, whom he had instructed in the art of drawing and painting in crayons. So he meets Burlington when they're in Italy. Burlington has got a terrible fever. He goes to Burlington and gives him um, lovely presents. They have this bond. Burlington hardly sees any Palladian architecture when he's in Italy and comes back to try and, in a sense, spearhead the Palladian revival, knowing nothing about Palladio's architecture. You can see how weirdly Ruritanian 18th century England really was, can't you? 
Um, and Kent is in the middle of it all. Yeah. And of course, Kent, because he doesn't know much about architecture, and because he hasn't got much taste, and he's really more interested in garish art, art than anything else, does these appalling interiors at Kensington Palace. I mean, just look at them. They are just awful. Niches of marble and pedestals with statues, gilt with burnished gold, which makes a terrible glaring show, and truly gothic, according to the weakness of the conceptions of the surveyors and controllers of the king's works, or their private peaks. Burlington gets him the job, he gets the job, um, and does it at Kensington with these terrible interiors. And it's all wood, painted wood, there's no marble, it's garish colours, it's on the cheap, it's 18th century England, Ruritania. That's what we were up to at the time, Kent in the middle of it. And of course he has the effrontery to paint himself right on the wall at the top, looking down with two mistresses next to him. But that's very Kent, isn't it? Are you getting him? Now, one thing interesting about Kent is he's brilliant on patterns. People who can't do um, likenesses are good, generally, on patterns. By the way, um, the king wouldn't sit for him. He was the king's painter, but he wouldn't sit for him because he couldn't do a likeness. I mean, fancy having the king's painter who can't e even paint the king. Um, but what he can do is very, very interesting interiors, based on what he's seen in Rome um, and based on French engravings of the time. If you look at the Jean Berrin on the right, and you look at the presence chamber Kensington on the left, that's probably the best thing in Kensington, and it looks very much like the sort of Raphael, neo-classical um, decorations that Raphael was doing in, <clears throat> in Rome particularly, um, but it's very close to French designs at the time. Remember, he's a copyist. He nicks things. He's a magpie. Um, and this is a very interesting quote, 1732, in conversation with a French bookseller. He wonders what's the matter with the English, but his observation has been, we are a hundred year behind them always. I think for a Frenchman, he's in the right, of course they hate French. As for what you and I do, it may be esteemed a hundred year hence, but at present does not look like it. And that's fascinating because most people thought that Kent's work was pretty awful at the time, and we tend to revere him now. I mean, one of the great things, again, about doing um, a good biography, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that I'm a good biographer or the Kent book is a good biography, it's just that you've got to be pretty circumspect about your subject, which is one of the reasons why my next biography is going to be Germaine Greer. <laughs> it is. Um, and this idea of eclecticism is interesting here because this is the great hokum in Norfolk for Thomas Cook. Um, and again, most people don't know quite what this hall is about. It was altered in um, execution by Matthew Brettingham. Let's just look at the house to start with. You can see it's a typical Palladian tower house in the center. But then we have these very interesting dependencies, these wings either side. And can you see how they move on a series of um, pediments and shouldered pediments? Think about the lodges at Claremont which are by Kent, and you've got the shoulders, yeah? And it basically comes from the Red and Tory, um, Palladio's church in, in, uh, in Venice. Um, but they're very interesting dependencies. Now, you might ask why there are four of them. Well, that's because, of course, he did this great big marble hall um, and a repository of the arts in the middle, and, of course, he had nowhere to live. So they had to have the dependencies to somewhere to live. But this is typical of not only Cook, but uh, Kent's conception. Uh, most people haven't really worked out what that hall is about, but that hall is basically um, Olympus because there was an enormous statue of Jupiter meant for it that was over eight feet high, and it was meant to stand on those steps there. I don't know if you remember the advert with Desmond Lynan coming down with a red carpet. Well, it was in this hall quite a time ago now, and where Desmond Lynan starts on the top is meant to be Jupiter. And, of course, Jupiter was dismantled and broke up into pieces and put in the conservatory, but they have found his head. So it was the Hall of Jupiter. Wonderful, wonderful neoclassical conception. Long, long before Robert Adam came back from Rome and started Italy and started doing um, fantastic things like Kedleston. Yeah. But then, of course, you've got these terrible, terrible tables that are obviously based on Roman tables, um, both early 18th century and antique 
early 18th century that he'd seen when he, he was in Rome. Um, it's interesting, the Ditchley one has lots of shells on the bottom. So again, you've got this fascination with eclecticism again. Um, but it's terribly, terribly garish and over the top. Now, what's clever about Kent is that he can be working for the king as part of the um, Office of Works because of Burlington's patronage, but he can also be working for the opposition because, of course, Prince Frederick, Prince of Wales, was very much in opposition to his own parents and had his own separate court. Uh, so Kent does this extraordinary state barge for the Prince of Wales, as you can see. Now, you can't call that Palladian, can you? You can't. I don't know quite what you can call it. There are mermen at the front. There are bare-breasted mer-women. Uh, there is a sort of a Palladian little canopy in the middle, but it is a wonderful, wonderful confection, um, which survives, as you can see, uh, at Greenwich. But at the same time, he's doing a very interesting garden at Carlton House with that temple, which is yet another banyo, um, a bathhouse. Um, and the garden at Carlton House is particularly interesting because it's very, very formally laid out on a great big axis with the barn at the end of it. He has these wings of trees, which is basically what he does, which are a mixture of deciduous and conifers, and you punctuate each section of them by urns or terms or herms. But then, interesting at Carlton House, there are lots and lots of island beds almost as if Humphrey Repton had come along and done all his awful island beds around about 1800. And trellis as well. So island beds, trellis, but then this long axis. Now this is interesting because it effectively means that in the 1730s, you're still hanging on to formality, but he is trying to soften it by bringing more flowers into the garden and also bringing height with trellises. So fascinating things going on. Again, he's trying to roughen up the mix of not only architecture, but also garden design. Um, are you all with me? You getting it? Yeah. Um, this is an interesting excursion. He, he wants to go Gothic. And there's lots of reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons is San Marco. One of the reasons is that you know, he's interested in native Gothic, probably because of Bridlington but also because he doesn't want to be a Palladian. His problem is that his main patron is an absolute lunatic for music and very little else. You know, Burlington wasn't really interested in architecture. He was just interested in music and art. Most of what he saw and did on the Grand Tour was to do with music and art. And so you've got this man coming and thinking, right, well, I've got to impose Palladianism on the 18th century, and I've got this malleable man, William Kent, Kent doesn't really want to be a Palladian architect. Kent wants to do stuff like this. And this is the exciting stuff. This is Gothic with a K. So top left, um, Westminster Hall, Court of the King's Bench. Bottom right, Gloucester Cathedral screen. Top right, the York pulpit. And bottom left, a candlestick. Again, in sort of weird eclectic fusion. And you can see there's elements of classicism and elements of Gothic in all of them. It's this eclectic urge that Kent is more interested in than anything else. And what happens then when we look at this eclectic urge and we then transplant it to gardens? And who is the person that's driving this? Is it Kent or is it the patrons? Now all those years ago I did that book, Gentlemen and Players, Gardeners of the English Landscape. I thought that was quite a good title actually because gentlemen and players, you know, lords, uh, the professionals and the amateurs. Um, publishers didn't understand what I was talking about. And I said, well, no, it's a good title. First book I did was Trumpet at a Distant Gate. And it went to the Frankfurt Book Fair, and they said, is it about music? And I said, no, no, it's about gate lodges. Oh, you can't have that title. So I did. It didn't sell, interestingly. And now I've had to change the title of Gentlemen and Players because you can't get it on Amazon. You can't Google it on eBay or Amazon, and it doesn't come up properly. So they said, could we call it Gentlemen Who Garden? And I said, no. And they said, could we call it Gardening Gentlemen? And I said, no. Why don't we call it Gentlemen Players? Because nobody can find it. I couldn't give a monkeys, I said. So they've called it Gentlemen Gardeners. So when it first came to me as proof, they said, we'll call it Gentlemen and Gardeners, and we'll say, the men who recreated the English landscape garden. And I said... So was there a landscape garden before they then recreated it? 
Oh, didn't they do that? This is what published. Any publishers in the room? So we had to come to a compromise. Gentlemen gardeners, the men who created the English landscape garden, then I looked at the blurb. Now, I split an infinitive quite a lot. I quite like it. Uh, Dylan Thomas split infinitives almost all the time to brilliant effect. But I try not to use cliches. I counted up the cliches in the blurb that they'd done for the book. There were 17. And the last one was an Englishman's garden truly is his castle. How about that? So I got my agent to rewrite it. We had one cliche to satisfy them. Anyway, um, when I wrote that book, Gentlemen and Players, all those years ago, 10 years ago this year, um, it was published, I was trying to make a point about who really created the informal garden, the Arcadian garden, the templed Arcadia that we've got outside. Um, and I have a sneaking suspicion that Caroline probably had a lot to do with it. Now, there was a very interesting conversation um, between um, lords and ladies of the period with Pope in about 1719, 1717. I'm not going to go into it now, um, but I talk about it in the Kent book. But come the 1730s, Queen Caroline, as she then was, was actually doing a brilliant garden at Richmond, which of course became Kew. Now, recent scholarship has suggested that Kent, who didn't get there until the 1730s, was not laying out the first garden, and I'll come to that in a minute. But what's significant is that when he did get there in the 1730s, he created two incredible garden buildings that everybody talked about. Uh, one of them they thought was good, and one of them they thought was a bit of a joke. Oh, and um, on the right is the embarkation of Cythera. It's a Vato painting, and it's an engraving based on that Vato paving, but showing in the background all of these garden buildings uh, that Kent put around Richmond Park. Now, the important thing about this is it doesn't look like an Arcadian garden, does it? It doesn't look a bit like an Arcadian garden. There's loads of fields for a start. There's loads of fences. And that's, of course, because George II loved to shoot partridges. And, of course, in the early 18th century, all gun stock was very heavy, with very long barrels. So the only thing you could do was shoot things on the ground. So grass, grouse, and partridge. But, of course, once they perfected very small guns, very light guns, with lighter stock, they could do the art of shooting flying, and then you get pheasants. So it goes sequentially like that. So at this point, you can only shoot them on the ground, so you've got to have lots and lots of fields to have the cover, so you can do that. But of course, what's happened here at Richmond is that you've got five mini wildernesses. Can you see them? I won't point them out, but you can see five little areas of bosky um, foliage with wiggly, wiggly paths. And these are where, of course, Kent was to site a lot of his garden buildings, some of which you can see around this Roke engraving. The two important ones are the one on the left, which is the Hermitage, and the one on the right, which is Merlin's Cave, both gone, of course, completely. Now, this is probably the most important quote in the whole of the talk. And this is the Earl of Egmont, 1734, talking about Caroline. I told her flatterers were fools, for generally princes see through it. True, said she, and therefore it must be done very gently and fine. Soon after which, Sir John rushed out, telling her that we owe our best taste in gardening to her, she replied, yes, indeed. I think I may say that I have introduced that in helping nature, not losing it in art. So you have to help nature and not lose it in art. Now, you could say, well, this just means that, you know, if you lose it in art, it's a formal garden. If you help nature, it's an informal garden. But then, of course, one needs to translate that into actual design. So what we really need is a garden that goes right the way across the whole of those fields with the fences taken down, with wildernesses in them, with open glades, and, of course, temples. And that's how you get your Arcadia. So at Richmond, we haven't quite got there. Now, just a bit about um, recent scholarship. Uh, in the 1720s, all of those um, little widdly wildernesses were laid out by the Greening family. One of my PhD, no, she, I wanted to do a PhD, but she was an MA student. 
she did a big uh, um, dissertation on the Greenings. And the Greenings were very interesting and important people, nurserymen, uh, garden designers, and they did those wildernesses before Kent got there. It's brilliant when you write a book and you get one of your students to refute it. It's the most brilliant thing that can ever happen to you. The only thing is you don't want them to do that in an interview, do you? And this was an American girl, Paige, and she came to me and she said, I want to come and see you for a weekend, and then I might come and do your MA. And I said, fine. So she came for a weekend, and I was so transfixed by her intellectually that I took her on. Um, and she's the one that worked out how to create three rainbows in a grotto. Nobody else had managed to work out how it was done at Wilton in the 1650s. And she worked it out in half an hour. She's a scientist. Great. Paige Johnson. She's going to be brilliant in the future. If only we can get her back from not doing nano batteries, um, which is what she does in America at the moment. Um, so these are the two garden buildings. Well, this is the first garden building. It's the um, Hermitage at Richmond. Kent uses the same design when he goes to Stowe. As you can see, it's a classical design, very rough, um, really straight out of sort of Italian design. But what's fascinating in, about it is that it is a pay-on, if, if you like, to both um, philosophy and science. And there were people in it like Locke and Burke, um, William Woolston, that were to do with natural philosophy as well as uh, science. And inside, a brilliant, brilliant design that's got touches of Rococo um, as well as classicism. But there on the top right hand is the picture that I showed you the staffage of very early on in the talk. And that is Kent as a satire, bending his knee and kissing Queen Caroline's hand. Now, of course, everybody that then reads that and says, oh, you're making it up. But I'm not making it up. There is the design for the hermitage. It's for Queen Caroline, and that is Kent kissing her hand. No doubt about it in my mind, if you know Kent. The other one was weird. It's like sort of Tahiti, isn't it? Tahiti with three domes. The most extraordinary confection. Um, and it was Merlin's cave. And of course, what Caroline was doing, very cleverly, because she was a very intelligent woman, she was trying to connect the Hanoverians with the Tudors, the Welsh Tudors, and then back through to Arthur and the time of Merlin. Um, Kent was working on illustrations for Spencer's Fairy Queen at this time, which is all to do with that particular period. Um, and there is Merlin as a waxwork, and you can also see Queen Elizabeth. There were also um, Elizabeth of York, Henry VII's wife. Um, Caroline was also having pictures, paintings done by Kent of um, Henry V. So she was interested in the Welsh connection, the Tudor connection with the English royal family, so that she could tap into it. So this was a piece of propaganda in London, and everybody went to see it. Most people thought it was a bit of a joke, but it was quite fun. The guy who actually looked after it was a man called Stephen Duck, and he was often very drunk when people came, and he got all the iconography wrong. So, you know, Gentleman's Magazine ridiculed him and it. But it was wonderfully gothic, and I just wanted to show you this one on the left, the bottom left. Um, that's uh, a pen and ink set in Gothic. Um, can you see it's got an owl on it? Wisdom. Isn't that beautiful? That's Kent. Are you getting him? Are you with me? You're very quiet. We're on YouTube soon. Come on. Okay. The two, the two most destructive people in terms of Horace Walpole in the whole of the 18th century is the Duke of Newcastle, as in here, and Henry Pelham, as in over there, or wherever Isha is, over there. Um, remember, I'm a boy from the sticks. I've never been here very much before. Um, and this is Henry Pelham in his temple at Isha, showing the side elevation of this extraordinary house that Kent did for him in the 1730s. Of course, Henry Pelham is to become prime minister, so again, a very important political man, and of course, working here as well for the Duke of Newcastle, also in the 1730s. Really, really key decade. Uh, that's what's left of Isha Place. Do any of you live in those houses around there? No? Some of you? There are very sort of executive houses around there, aren't they? Rather lovely. Uh, but of course, you're living on what would have been. Some of you are smiling. You do live there, don't you? Goodness me, I haven't said anything naughty about it. I almost said something then, but I didn't. Um, this is how you create a 
Arcadian garden from a formal garden. This is actually quite a fun bit. I don't know whether we're going to manage to get this on YouTube. Yeah? Okay. Concentrate. Are you with me? Right. Let's look at the top one, because this is... No, no, no. Where's Jeremy? What's the time? Five past. So we've done 35 minutes. Right. Okay. Are you with me? Are you, can you... Yep. Right. Now, I've got to have my back to you, because I've got to see what I'm, what I'm up to. On the top is Isha Pre-Kent 1708. Uh, there is the... It's the mole, isn't it? Yeah, it's me. It's the mole. Yeah. There it is. Can you see it? There's the Wainfleet's Tower, which, of course, is the Tudor Tower that was the core of the house. And can you see its formal gardens all around it with walls? And there are banqueting pavilions, and there is a canal. Can you see it's a rectangular canal, and there's an orchard there, and there are tree lines here, and then that is just a scrubby piece of orchard, and that's the main road. And then big avenue, big avenue. This is interesting. It's a raised bowling green lined with trees. Now, have you all got that? Yes? I'll come over here. You got it? Okay. So what does Kent do? This is the Roke, after Kent's been at it. We still have the big long axis, but suddenly you opening up the house to the axis by Hippodrome, which of course we see at Chiswick as well. One of these hippodromes is very much based on Robert Castell's Villas of the Ancient that came out in 1728 when he wrote about Pliny's Villas and said that a hippodrome is one of the features that you have. Uh, again, totally spurious and fictitious, but it's Burlington again. He's a wretch. There's your house. And what he's done here is that he's opened up the view of the house to the river by taking away all the walls, all the banqueting pavilions, and just giving it grass. He's letting it breathe. Okay? Then he keeps the kitchen garden, which is there, so you keep it. But then he loses the orchard completely, again opening it up, and then he makes the rectangular canal trapezoid to change it, to make it more various, to make it more interesting. And at the head of it, of course, puts a temple, and that's the one you've just been seeing Henry Pelham with Thomas Roberts looking back to the side of the house. But this is the exciting bit. There, it was an orchard, possibly, certainly a scrubby bit of ground. He is now starting to put wiggling, winding, what Batty Langley calls arty natural paths. And if you look carefully, that is what's left of the road. Yep. And the road, of course, has been taken away from the front of the house. And in this area, he puts garden buildings. Also, he puts around this area a fosse with bastions so that you can look out into the landscape so that the livestock don't come in. And then, if we look very, very carefully, you're looking for the bowling green. And the bowling green has gone, although, of course, it's revetment still there, and he's putting uh, clump trees. And that's how you soften and loosen nature's tresses. One could do a whole lecture about women and sexuality and garden writing in the 18th century. It's all about caressing nature, nature's tresses. Uh, and that's what he does. It's a loosening of the formalities. It's not a losing of the formalities. It's a loosening of the formalities. Okay? And that's what he does at Isha. And, of course, this is what he does all over the place. Because, generally, Kent doesn't do a new landscape. He just goes where people are being... Thank you, Jeremy. Particularly Bridgman, and softens what they've done. And this, of course, is what you get at Isha. You get this great Gothic house with a rotunda or belvedere behind it on the hill and uh, a Chinese, sort of almost Chinese Chippendale bridge and this lovely lake, which is much more informal now. Um, the little wings to the house have canted bays so that you can look at all different aspects of the scene. You're bringing the house out into the nat natural amphitheatre. And then you have Horace Walpole going there and talking about this brilliant picnic he had. And I have to read it to you because it is so fantastic. This is one of the best descriptions of having a good night out in the 18th century you ever come across. We had a magnificent dinner 
cloaked in the modesty of earthenware. French horns and hoat boys on the lawn. We walked to the Belvedere on the summit of the hill, where a threatened storm only served to heighten the beauty of the landscape. A rainbow on a dark cloud falling precisely behind the tower of a neighbouring church. From thence we passed into the wood, and the ladies formed a circle on the chairs before the mouth of the cave, which was overhung to a vast height with woodbines, lilacs, and laburnums, and dignified by those tall, shapely cypresses. On the descent of the hill were placed the French horns, the Abigails, servants, and neighbours wandering below by the river. In short, it was Parnassus, as Vatto would have painted it. Brilliant, isn't it? Brilliant evocation. Uh, do you know what time he got back home? Half past three. They had supper at midnight. Supper. My goodness, clubbing. I can't tell you. And Walpole actually danced. Can you believe Walpole danced, sort of mincing around? Extraordinary. Um, that's Isha, where some of you now live. And of course, Isha was a very eclectic landscape. It didn't just have garden buildings and classical temples. Um, it had thatched houses, as you can see, very much like Merlin's Cave. Um, and there were designs for Chinese buildings. It's Kent wanting us to enjoy the variety and eclectic styles of the period. And you get this in all his buildings. His buildings are very interesting because they were always highly textured. He's very, very interested in doing different types of materials for, for his buildings. Here, of course, we have the Pebble Alcove at Stowe. Templar quam delecta, how delightful, how beautiful are thy temples, and they happen to be the temple family. Um, and so he does a pebble alcove, and in the middle of it, in the pediment, he does a pebble. That's a big pebble. I mean, that's absolutely typical of Kent. And it's a riot of, of detail. It's been restored, but of course it's good. And it's three different types of stone and three different types of treatment of stone. Um, the Hermitage has pans pipes on the right, as you can see, and then the Congreve Monument with the, uh, this monument to this great dramatist of the monkey looking in the mirror, um, which is very much a, um, a leitmotif of, of drama. He's wonderfully inventive, it's Kent. Um, he must have been fantastic uh, before he got absolutely sozzled uh, as, a, as a drinking and dinner companion. Now, what happens at Claremont is, in a sense, very similar to what happened at Isha. Here you have this vast formal landscape for the original house. Remember, Vanbra owned it originally. It was called Chargate, and then became Claremont when the Earl of Clare had it. Um, and then we have great formal axes and avenues going across the front of the house. And then behind the house, you get the spine garden on the ridge. And the spine garden originally laid out by Vambra, um, and then with work later on by Bridgman. And you can see that circular pool on the top left. So all axial, um, all fairly formal, that great big long sweep along the ridge with a belvedere behind the house that Vambra does. Then, of course, after it's sold, we then in the 1730s get Kent coming along for the Duke of Newcastle, as he then became. And he starts to actually do interesting things. He retains some of the formality, as you can see here, from the Belvedere and that great big um, axial line to the bowling green, um, and then starts to add garden buildings to those areas and then softens other areas. That's the Rigo. Can you see the Rigo? I can't actually see it from here. Is it all right? It's not brilliant, is it? But you can see that there's the temple, which is gone, and it's exactly the same view uh, as we had today. These views are very important for um, restoration. Um, the Paynes Hill people are uh, brilliant at this, and, and so are the Claremont people. I wish Chiswick was. I mean, this idea of having the um, hedges too high. They're always too high. You know, you've got a herm, and you've got head and shoulders on the herm, and you're meant to have the hedge about here, so you can see the head and shoulders. So that when you walk around the side, and you're walking through the garden, and you look behind you, you can see the head and shoulders over the hedge. You go to Chiswick, the hedges are all like this big. You can't see anything. I don't know whether it's better now. Hopefully it is. I haven't been there since they've done the work. But then I got so annoyed about them putting that marquee there. Um, 
So, here is the Roke engraving showing the softening of that original landscape by Bridgman um, and Vambra. And as you can see, all around the Roke engraving, you have the garden buildings. Now, very interesting in, at Claremont, almost all of them are classical. And, you know, um, adaptations and modifications on sort of Palladian uh, designs. Um, the one down the very bottom, David, what's it called? I can't remember what you said it was called now. Is it called the White House? The White House? There it is. There it is. On the Roke engraving. See? Which we've got surviving. Almost all the other ones, um, well, some of the other ones have gone. Um, and I don't need to, again, go through the Isha comparison I've just been with you, but you can see at the front of the house, we've lost one of the great formal axes. We've got clumps of trees instead. There are a lot more arty natural winding paths along that spine. We've lost that round, round geometric pond, and suddenly we've now got a lake, uh, and then the amphitheater looks down to the lake. Now, the amphitheater is definitely a Bridgman feature, but the lake and the softening of the lake, I'm sure, is part of Kent trying to loosen the straps. Think of Palladianism as a straitjacket, and Kent is in this straitjacket, and garden design is in this straitjacket, and it's got to be loosened out. And that's what Kent does. So there's the amphitheater on the right, um, and there is Kent's temple in the middle of the lake, um, and of course the cascade, as you can see, on the left. The amphitheater is interesting because uh, I personally think that these amphitheaters that uh, Bridgman was interested in doing um, were for theatricals, um, and for displaying plants, and for sitting in, and I'm, I'm sure they, der they derive straight from the Bobbly Gardens, because that's the first thing you see when you go to Florence. Um, as with all my students, the first thing we see is the Bobbly. Uh, and these lovely paintings that were commissioned around about 1750, um, John Harris, um, you know, the most lovable rogue in the world, um, John and I go back a long way, uh, he called this particular artist, who's anonymous, the master of the tumbling chairs. And you can see that almost all of them have got tumbling chairs. Can you see how many chairs there are, though? And that's what these gardens were for. They were meant to be uh, sat in. And then you get the perfection of it all. And this is Kent, uh, Kentissimi, as Walpole would have said. Um, I think Rousham is probably the most perfect and beautiful garden in, in England, certainly. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I remember what I said earlier, go behind things. And the reason you go behind things, not because Venus has a shapely bum, but she does, but you see where she's looking. And you need to see how to see these gardens. And the exciting thing about Rousham, one of the most really exciting things about Rousham, is you can't see it. And the reason you can't see it is because you have to walk it. You have to interact with it. It's incredibly interactive, but you can't see it. The only place you can see some of Rousham is on the other side, along the main road, looking back. And you're never, ever meant to see it from there. Because you're always meant to be part of the family or the guests that walk through. Um, and my eyes were opened to Rousham by someone who is in the audience, who was my first PhD student, Sue Gordon, over there. Uh, she's the expert on Rousham, so I have to be very careful on my metal. He felt the delicious contrast of hill and valley changing imperceptibly into each other, tasted the beauty of the gentle swell or concave swoop. See what I mean about women? And remarked how loose groves crowned an easy eminence with happy ornament. And while they called in the distant view between their graceful stems, removed and extended the perspective by delusive comparison. It's Walpole again, writing uh, in the 1770s, but published in 1782, History of the Modern Taste in Gardening. Really seminal work on garden history. Um, he felt the delicious contrast of hill and valley changing imperceptibly into each other. And that's the Arcadian landscape, contoured, long before Brown, that awful man, that destroyer of these great landscapes, came and destroyed them all, uh, and long before Repton started doing contouring. Kent does it all before. So here is Rousham and Venus's Vale. Venus's Vale, women. Why doesn't someone do a book on, I should, I'll do that, next one. Oh, I can't go on about General Dormer, but General Dormer, 
bachelor, military man, absolutely dotty on bronzes, as William Kent says in 1738, although he's crippled by a regular fit of the gout, he is still bronzo mad. Um, and here is the interior of the parlor with one of those Kent ceilings again, uh, the grotesque work, because remember, Kent's good at patterning. And there is this extraordinary house with Gothic wings looking out to a paddock with Longhorn cattle who are successors of Longhorn cattle that were there in the 1730s, 1738. We know that there were Longhorn cattle there. This is how you bring the paddock right to the house, and you do it, of course, by a ha-ha. Um, this is the garden in 1738. Um, and just to show you, there's the bowling green. Oh, dear. Here is the river, the Serpentine River. Here's the Elm Walk, as it then was. And here are uh, lots of Wiggly Pass. And there is Venus's Vale. Um, and that's the walk to the paddock where there is a castellated barn. Now, can you see? You can't see that garden. You can't. You can only walk it. It's really clever. But remember, again, it's only clever because Bridgman's laid out the framework, and then Kent just loosens the framework. And Kent does this clever thing of when you're on the top terrace and you look out into the landscape, he calls in the country, as Pope says, or brings in the country into the landscape by putting garden buildings in the landscape to make it look as though the whole of your landscape is a garden. Um, General Dormer, the dying man at the time, so the dying gladiator is a very, very um, apposite thing to put in the, um, in the garden. And in terms of iconography, Shoemaker's horse attacked by a lion can be read as tamed nature and untamed nature. And of course, Rousham is a, an epitome of certain areas that are tamed and certain areas that are untamed. Um, but there's a lot more iconography in it, and you need to read Sue's brilliant thesis on this. Um, there is the paddock with the castellated barn, and here is the great Pyreneste arcade. And typical of Kent, if you know your classical architecture, you have porticos that are two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? You never have three, five, seven, nine. Kent does. That's seven. Seven arches. He's clever. He's clever. But can you see? It's his mind. It's him. You know it's him because he's playing with you playfully all the time. And then, of course, there's this big thing about General Dormer and his obsession with the Antinous. And I got into terrible heavy water when I did the book on um, Kent about this. But the best review I had was in The Guardian, and it was by Alan Hollinghurst. Uh, he had a brilliant review, absolutely brilliant. Uh, you know, he didn't like lots of the book, and he loved lots of the book. Uh, but he was very, very interested in the Antinous, who, of course, was Hadrian's male lover, who died in the Nile, suspiciously. And, of course, if you look carefully at the statue, you can see that there are bulrushes behind him. Now, the problem we've got with the 18th century is uh, often the people that leave the records are stewards or gardeners, and they don't understand the iconography of the statues. Sometimes he's called the Colossus. Sometimes he's called the Apollo. There's no doubt in my mind it's the Antinous. And it's General Dormer again. Because what are gardens if not reflections of the psyche of the people that create them? How many of you have been round to Highgrove? Yeah. It's Prince Charles, isn't it? It's him. It's his interests. It's his obsessions. It's his personality. And this is an interesting, too. We're getting very close now. What's the time, Jeremy? Um, oh, I'm a little over. Um, <laughs> these are two designs by Kent, would you believe? There is the Worcester Lodge, very, very Palladian at Badminton, three miles from the house, one of the greatest of the garden buildings. As you can see, all it is is a dining room. All it is. It's one of the most perfect and poetic dining rooms that's ever been done. But on your right is the monument to John Churchill at Blenheim. I mean, you couldn't get something more Baroque than that, could you? And that's designed by Kent. The eclectic urge is what Kent's about. And that's what makes him a great man. Now, I just wanted to show you that lovely picture of the rabbits uh, again and Kent lolling by the obelisk at uh, Chiswick. And I want to give you two quotes. The first one is by George Virtue, who, as I said, is a very unreliable source to people of this period. And the last one is the last lines of the book I wrote on Kent. 
By slow increase of his distemper, suddenly overpowered and tended to a mortification in his bowels and feet, especially inflamed. Attended he was with great care at Burlington House, a fortnight or three weeks when he died of a mortification all over on Tuesday, April ye 12th, 1748, his age about 60. Virtue could not even get his age right. Kent was 63 and about four months, in a gesture of friendship and respect, which meant more then than it might today. Lord Burlington had his companion buried in the Burlington family vault at Chiswick. There at least was one love that did, not, that did dare speak its name, because it had nothing to hide and much to celebrate. And there he is, in the portrait by William Aikman, looking terribly self-satisfied, the second Raphael that couldn't even catch a likeness. Thank you. Okay, have you all been... I don't do Facebook. I like to keep my pr private thoughts to myself. Um, but um, apparently you will be panned across to if you've got questions. And I will do my best to answer them. And um, those of you in the audience that really know me, tell me to be quiet. Do we have any cards that should come forward? Okay. You want to, oh, uh, no, no, they've got to tell me. I yes, need to know read, who they are. Read, I'm sorry, you're right. I need you to know the who cards. they are. We're not going to do that. Let's go ahead and read the cards here. Oh, this is Alison Weir, who's about to come on the MA in October, and if it's a good question, she will do really well. <laughs> uh, is it a coincidence that Payne's Hill is so close to Isha Place and Claremont? No. Good question. Yeah, I mean, all of these people were um, vying competitively with one another, but in a very um, amicable way. They were all sharing ideas. They were all sharing the notions of how garden design should be being developed. And, of course, it's difficult for us to go back to think through what they were doing. I mean, we garden historians try to sort of intellectualize it, but basically what they were doing were modern improvements. That's all they were interested in. Rather like we, you know, suddenly in Chelsea, Piet Oldorf does prairie planting, and you see it all over the place. And that's, in a sense, what was happening. There was no Chelsea at that time to drive fashion, but what drove fashion was people's patronage circles, their connections. And I'm sure that that's what happened. So when Pope talks about that council in 1719 of all the interested people to do with gardens, they would all meet and they would discuss and they would then change their gardens uh, based on those ideas. Um, and Pamela or Alice, I think mentioned, I think it was Pamela, uh, the Kit Kat Club. You know, it's an age of clubs. So not only did they know each other through um, the House of Lords, but they knew each other through clubs and they talked a lot in the coffee houses um, and swapped ideas. So yes, I'm sure that's the key. And of course, we've got Paynes Hill, Isha, and Claremont. Three major, major gardens of the period. Very, very close. And of course, these Rococo, the word has been used by John Harris, particularly these Rococo, but I like to use the word eclectic gardens of the 1730s and 40s. They're all clustered around the Thames. Again, you know, they are small estates, some of them, and they, everybody knew everybody else. So we've got Pope at Twickenham, we've got Walpole at Strawberry Hill, we've got Marble Hill. It's all in that area. And there were so many more. Um, and, you know, that great um, artist, Thomas Robbins, has been the one that has made most of the paintings of them. These tremendous eclectic gardens, you know, with Chinese and summer houses, Turkish tents and so on. Paints Hill, Turkish tent gothic umbrellas, um, and the planting itself. They would swap ideas on planting and swap plants and so on. So yeah, everybody knew everyone else, and they were feeding off each other. Yeah, is that all right? Yeah. Another one? There's got to be a lot more. Pamela. 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 Hang on, Pamela, I can't hear. Sorry. Sorry, 
sorry. Sorry, I'm, um, I'm very impressed by the number of buildings he designed. Would he have people who would, he would just do the design and then he had people building them all. Oh, yeah, yeah. He couldn't, so do, he couldn't do any of the practical work at He all. wasn't practical at no, all. No, 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 no. I mean, neither was Vambra. I mean, Vambra was just uh, basically no. a dramatist, a soldier, a playwright, um, sketch, 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 and then had Hawksmoor, the architect, who'd worked with Wren, to put into um, you know, bricks and stone uh, his designs. Same thing with Kent. Yeah. Kent would do uh, designs, and then the designs would be used by people on the ground. And in terms of the actual garden design, which I suppose is as relevant, if not more so, um, at Rousham, Sue will correct me, but we don't even know if he went to Rousham, do we? We know that the steward was there trying to deal with all of the things that were needed, but very often General Dormer didn't go there because he was in London, and very often we don't even know if Kent was actually specifying some of the plants and the trees that were put in the garden. That's right, isn't it? So, yes, he would have the idea, and other people would see it to execution, both in gardens and in plant, sorry, planting and in architecture. I think Tony wants to have a go. Could we have, let's have this gentleman here, and then we'll do, and then we'll do Tony. Uh, my name's Steve Webb. Um, Hi, do Steve. we know what um, Henry Pelham thought of what William Kent had done for him at, at Isha Place? Good question. I have no idea. I don't think there's any record, which is one of the real problems about writing about gardens, because you don't, in fact, know what they're asking for, and they don't know, you don't know whether they're happy with what they've got. It's a really good question, and I, I can't answer it, because we just don't have it. I mean, basically, our garden history is based on um, visitor accounts, Walpole's description of that fantastic evening he spent there, um, and obviously cartographic evidence, you know, maps and how they change. Um, but it would seem to me that Pelham was very, very pleased with his garden because if he chose to have a portrait with his secretary in a garden building, um, I think, you know, he was pretty proud of what he'd achieved. I suppose the other thing as well is that everybody came to Isha. And what we don't seem to realize, or you know, what a lot of people don't seem to realize, garden historians do, is that um, in terms of sort of the Gothic revival, Isha is far more important than Strawberry Hill. And the reason that Strawberry Hill's got such a big press and such a big presence now is two reasons. One, Walpole is a shameless self-publicist. And two, Strawberry Hill survives. Pelham much, much more austere man and a politician, and the house is almost gone with all of those wonderful houses that people now live in. Um, and it's, so it's the accident of history, in a sense. And what we as garden historians have got to do is you've got to get back to what was really on the ground at the time. So the only thing I can say is that he was very proud of what he'd achieved, and everybody wanted to go to Isha. It was the great Parnassus, as, Wal as Walpole said. Thanks, Steve. Good question. Now, Tony. Uh, Tony Pratt. Um, just to go back to the planting, um, you mentioned that uh, Kent is the man who, who he, he tends to bring in not so many of the, um, of the British natives. He goes more exotic. Yeah. Um, presumably, that is to do with the, the loosening of the formality. Yeah. Um, how important is that element of the, of the design? Because we, we talk a lot about the buildings because we've got the writing for them. But being a gardener, the plantings, mm. how important are the plantings and the types of plants being used? They become more important as the century progresses, really. I mean, again, I think it's, it's Burlington's fault, and we will call it a fault, um, to have underwritten the publication of this book, Villas of the Ancients, by Castell which came out in 1728. Um, and that was based on Pliny's letters, but it was based on a partial reading of Pliny's letters. If you really read Pliny's letters, they don't say half of the things that Castell makes out that they say in terms of garden design. But effectively, what you get through the Castell uh, publication and through Burlington's work at Chiswick is effectively green and white. Green and white. You have white statuary against greenery and hedges. And that's basically what the Plinian or the early Palladian garden. It's very difficult to say what it is. It's just gardens attached to Palladian villas of the 1720s and 30s. 
But interestingly, at Carlton House, as I said, you're getting a lot more um, colourful exotic plants coming in in terms of island beds at Carlton House, and that's 35. And then you get more um, pleasure grounds and shrubberies closer to the house with more exotics into the 40s and the 50s. And, of course, the person that's done the, the brilliant work on this is Mark Laird, who did that great book, The Flowering of the English Pleasure Ground. Um, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but five or six years ago. And so what's happening is that the green and white, rather austere, very intellectual garden is being subsumed into the eclectic garden, and Kent's part of that. Not that I think that Kent knew very much about plants, but of course the people at the gardens did, as the Rousham letters tell us. So William White, the steward, knew, um, knew what plants were coming in. Um, so that's what I think happens. You, you, you've basically got a, a quite a simple palette that then gets pretty rich. And then, of course, what happens? Brown. Chink. Now, Brown actually does do flower gardens, but very few. And he, he goes back for the minimalism. So it's a sort of plen pendulum change. And then, of course, you get the appalling, obsequious Humphrey Repton, who reminds me of sort of Uriah Heep, sucking up to everybody. And he brings flowers back again, but brings them back in a very garish, um, unstructured, unsophisticated way. Awful man, Repton. Oh, dear, we're on YouTube. <laughs> Lovely man, just wonderful. Is that all right? Hmm? Hmm. Are there any more questions? I'll come to you in a minute, Jeremy. Um, Janet Hurrell. Janet, um, yes. Did you say that Caroline was a, um, a plant person? Or yeah. did I? Carry on. No, I, I was just yes. saying, or did I misremember? Yes, she was interested, yes, yeah. in plants. We don't know very much about that, but we do know she was interested in plants and planting, as well as in creating these garden buildings with her iconography. What, se what seems to have happened at Richmond, though, in her period, is that it was the iconography that, that was important to her, to legitimise her House of Hanover's claim to the throne. Mm. That was basically what she was trying to do. Um, and I always pronounce it incorrectly, Jim. Is it Leibniz or Leibniz? Come on, Jim. Leibniz. I'm going to put you on the spot. That's Jim Bartos. He's doing a PhD with me for you YouTube listeners and viewers. Is it Leibniz or Leibniz? Is it I-E or E-I? Leibniz? Okay. Um, Leibniz, of course, had done a lot of work for um, the, Hanover, the House of Hanover to try and connect them to the Guelphs so that they would then have an Italian... Um, background. Uh, so he was the guy that was doing the historical work. So she had actually been taught by him in the Queen of Prussia's court, and she was more interested in, as I say, in iconography at Richmond. But she was also interested in plants. And we know that that Richmond garden had lots of flower areas within the wildernesses, under planting. Yeah? Okay. Uh, Jeremy. Leibniz. Leibniz. Jeremy Garnett. Jeremy. Um, this is really about the patronage relationship uh, between Kent and Burlington. Yeah. Um, bearing in mind that we've been hearing about the uh, desire to move into sort of you know, eclectic um, expression, um, how does that sit with the, 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 the straitjacket of Palladianism? Um, which Burlington is very much connected. I mean, how, how, how easy was that relationship? Um, and, and how did that sit with Kent? It wasn't, it's a very good question, and it's something, in a sense, I should have addressed, and I can now. It's a good question. Um, before 1733, Kent was very much in Burlington's pocket, and work that he was doing for Burlington was pretty chaste. But there was always a hint of the Rococo about his predilections at that stage. And when you look at Queen Caroline's hermitage, for instance, although outside it's very Palladian in a rock-faced way, it's quite Rococo inside. Now, of course, yet again, England's way behind France because France were doing uh, Rococo interiors in about 1705. 
they were doing those grotesque interiors, Jean Barin, about 1710. So with Burlington, what Kent does is he sort of infiltrates in an interior design sense elements that he's seen, particularly in Rome. So you get quite a lot of quattrocento details that he brings in, particularly at Chiswick. But on the outside, you get a very austere villa. You do, however, get an austere villa that's actually based on about seven or eight different villas. I mean, the whole idea that Chiswick is based on the Villa Capra is nonsense. It's nothing like the Villa Capra at Vicenza. It's much closer to work by Palladio's pupil Scamozzi. So Burlington, remember, Burlington doesn't really appreciate Palladian architecture because he doesn't, hasn't seen it in the flesh. And what he's done is he's collected a lot of these drawings of Roman baths. So you get a lot of interiors that look as though they come out of Roman baths with great coffering, which Kent does for him based on all of these designs and drawings. And then, of course, and we don't know anything about this. This is one of the big mysteries of doing the book. Um, Burlington has a nervous breakdown in 1733. He really definitely has a nervous breakdown, and he leaves the court, and he loses all of his sinecures, and all of his control. And Kent is suddenly free as a bird. And what happens in 1733? Isha Claremont. Early work, possibly at Stowe. And then he moves through the 30s without Burlington breathing down his neck and creates the eclectic urge and creates the Arcadian Garden. It's still Arcadian, but it's Arcadian with a twist. And that's what I think happens. Uh, so Burlington, some malign influence, finishes. So someone needs to do a lot more work on that 1733 nervous breakdown. Good question. Uh, any more? Any more? Yes, the lady there. Um. My question just follows on in respect of Lord Burlington, and I wondered if, in fact, there was a possible political motivation. Um, is there a link between Burlington's promotion of Palladian and the Whig Party versus the promotion of the Baroque with the Tories? Ah, interesting. Uh, good question. No. <laughs> no, because... Um, as you will appreciate yourself, that's quite too simple, really, isn't it? It's quite simple. That, that way of looking at things in sort of, um, you know, it's not a simple question, but the way of looking at it sort of with the two polar opposites. Um, because when you actually look at the patronage of the period, quite a lot of Tories are building Palladian villas. It's not just a Whig house style. It's, it starts as the Whig house style, and then they perfect it, and then everybody basically does it. So I think initially it was a political gesture and it was a gesture of getting them back to Augustan Rome. Effectively what they do is this. I always get a bit anal about this. It's talking to my counsellor, who is not a counsellor, but he's a friend of mine who's like a counsellor. Um, here we are with the Whigs and we're going to create this house style and this house style has got to be Augustan, effectively. So, you know, we've got to get back there. But, you know, we haven't really, we don't really know what's there. And we've been on a grand tour, but, you know, we've been duped by people. Kent being one of them, sold us lots of bronzes that are all fakes. He did that. And so the best way to do it is via Palladio. So you, so you do Palladio, who, of course, tries to recreate neoclassically the past, and then we're here, so we do Palladio, and then we think, right, well, Palladio's version of the antique is okay for us, and we then can connect with Augustan Rome, and we then can make this political gesture. That becomes our house style. Now, what's interesting is, again, if you read the text, this is something I just bang into the heads of my students all the time. You can't just read Tim Mole and think about what he says, unless you're going to disagree with him or challenge him. What you can do is you can read the texts. And, of course, the text to read is Shaftesbury, Lord Shaftesbury, who's effectively the founder of the Whig Party. And you read his characteristics, and you find out what he says. And all he says is that there should be a resurgence in the arts and the sciences. We are looking for a new 
spirit in the arts and sciences, but he doesn't say what style it should be. He never, ever suggests a style. What he's suggesting is we need to go back to the past to create this new um, Halcyon period. And the Whigs just latch onto Palladio, and then politically they push it through. But by the 17, 1725, 1726, quite a lot of Tories are doing it. The Tories, of course, have been doing Baroque architecture before 1714 and the Hanoverian succession, accession, but they then, second generation, start doing it. You know. Yes, yeah, very, yes, very good. Yes, it's very like that. And, and again, you've got to think of the generations are really important, I think, because um, Summerson wrote a brilliant essay long ago about the amount of houses that were being built in the 1720s and 30s. So you'd had this old generation of Baroque houses, and then you get the 1714 succession, and then they all start building houses again, so you get all these Palladian villas. And then you get to about the end of the 1740s, and you get the second generation again coming in, and they think, oh, God, these Palladian villas, you know, they're dark, and they're, they're not fit for our, uh, our world. They're not Italian for um, temperature, so you then start to get a modification of them by canted bays to bring in the country and so on. And then you get brilliant houses like this, where you get a neoclassicism that's based on archaeology. So I'm sort of moving around a bit. For example, originally plans to build a Palladian house. Yeah. And then Palladian architects came in and built the Palladian Yeah. yeah. Three. I think, that's, I think that's the key to everything that happened. In the 1730s, we started going eclectic. I was interested at Isha. Um, there is the Kent drawing, of course, for a great Palladian house, like you said, on, on, on the ridge. But then Kent says, no, hang about. I'm not going to have the Wainfleet Tower as just a, an eye catcher. It's going to be the house itself. And that's, I think that's probably one of the most important drawings of the 1730s, because it shows the two ways, and he goes this way, and he makes the garden go that way. Otherwise, it could have been like Chiswick. So, yeah. So, you live in Isha, do you? Yeah. Do you live in one of those big houses by the Wainfleet Tower? Do you? Do you? Go on, you do, don't you? What are you doing for supper? Are you, is there a good restaurant here? Yeah? <laughs> Tell me more about Isha. David, are you still all right? Any, any other questions? Uh, another question. Another question? Lady over here. Lady over, what's your name? Charlotte. Yeah. Oh, right, yes. Hello. Um, I'd always understood um, William Kent in terms of his... Um, what he was doing in gardens a little bit more than uh, in terms of his his involvement with theatre because he was a theatre yeah, yeah. you haven't really touched on that can I you haven't have I can you touch on it a little bit more I could do <laughs> um, how, how significant do you not think I, I, mean, I think yes I think he is very very theatrical um, I was asked when I did the book did you all hear the question by the way yeah this, this interest in theatre. I was asked when, I was, um, when I'd finished the book to talk about an episode in Kent's life that really suggested the mind of the man. And interestingly, I chose um, a theatrical occasion, which happened to be a marriage um, in the Royal Chapel at Kensington, uh, because he had done the designs for the interior of the chapel for this extraordinary royal wedding, um, where the groom didn't have a neck and came in looking as though he had no neck, and it was really quite ah, dangerous and disaster. I won't go on about it, it's, in, it's the beginning of the book. And they said, you know, do something quite salacious and odd and weird. And so I had to then talk about, you know, the first night in bed and everything. You know what publishers are like. Um, but he did the designs for the interior of the chapel for that wedding, and he designed them almost as if they were a theatre set. Um, and I think I wrote about it and said something like it was, uh, it was a cross between sort of John Piper's sets for opera and sort of Versace uh, fabrics, because it was all wonderful fabrics hanging down. Um, and a lot of his book illustrations are quite theatrical 
in, in their presentation. So did he not do it? He didn't do any theatre designs or anything like that. I, I don't know why. I sort of thought he... Well, he did, he did triumphal arch designs for theatrical ceremonials. But in terms of theatre, not, not as far as I know. But there is a real theatricality to him, which I think you're right to concentrate on. And if I go back to the most interesting of the drawings, which is the Queen Caroline as the shepherdess, there is a sort of almost like an amphitheatre behind them with that garden building, almost as if this is a stage that's, set. That's what they look like to me. Exactly. And I think that, again, his garden buildings, they always um, have wings, almost like flats of trees. It's, these quite, deciduous. it's quite formulaic in a way, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But then, of course, that's going back to French design for formal gardens, which are like flats receding in perspective. I remember what Walpole said about him, talking about this contour, easy flow, but then the deception of the perception, the perspective deception, which of course you get in theatre design. So yeah, interesting question. Yeah, so lady here, have you got one or is that just nothing on it? It's nothing on it. It's nothing on it. I think we've probably got time for just one more, if there is one more. If there isn't one more, then I think it's down the pub, isn't it? Isha High Street must have some good pubs. They look a bit pucker to me. I'm a Bristol boy, you know, from the rough side of Bristol. Any more questions? No, I think we're okay, David. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming tonight. It's been I a real pleasure. It. Thank you, Tim. It's been a real pleasure. You'll, you'll be hearing from us again uh, for the next year. We'll be planning the next annual event. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you for coming. Well, good afternoon, 
and welcome to our first annual Claremont Garden History Lecture Series. We're very, very happy to have so many of you uh, come and join us today because we think this will be a, a wonderful talk. My name is Alice Stanley Durvin and I'm the principal here at Claremont Fancourt School. If you've had the opportunity to look around the house and grounds a little bit, I'm sure you'll agree that it is a wonderful, wonderful blessing for every one of us who work here and for the children who go to school here to um, just experience this, this environment every single day. We are all very aware that having this wonderful site brings with it the responsibility also to care for the house and the gardens. And our school is very, very much committed to making sure that we retain and restore and improve in keeping with the site. Um, so we've, we've done lots of work on it and will continue. You can see from the lines here that we're in the process of restoring this building, this room, um, to its, its grandeur. Um, we're also very committed to learning about our site because that's one of the ways, of course, that we improve and, um, and take care of it. And so we have the opportunity today to do just that. We're going to learn about historic gardens. I'd like to introduce David Regal. David and his wife, Barbara, have been the main organizers of this event, and we greatly appreciate their love for the school and their interest in historic gardens. And then David will introduce our speaker. Well, isn't this something? Um, you, uh, many of you probably have gotten an email from me, and I really appreciate seeing you here today. Um, welcome to what we hope to be at least an annual lecture on garden history. Um, Claremont, what a... ...each book in the first ones, and I tend to spend about six or seven months doing each of mine. But now I'm very fortunate in that I have people to work with me, uh, funded by the Leverhulme, um, and so we're doing it a bit quicker, but not as quickly as I might like. Um, at the moment, I've got two books to write before Christmas, and teaching and everything, but that's great. That's what one wants to do. But this is, um, in true Blue Peter fashion, this is one I did earlier um, on um, William Kent. Um, it's brilliant, isn't it, doing uh, a biography of someone that you rather despise in many ways, um, or at least you think is a bit of a drunkard, um, not a terribly good architect, but quite a clever and intelligent gardener. Um, I'd done a couple of biographies before, one on Horace Walpole and one on William Beckford. Um, Walpole um, I really disliked, uh, even though he was really quite an exciting um, commentator on the 18th century, but he was so, so bitchy, I mean really bitchy bachelor. Um, and then, of course, I had Beckford, and of course Beckford was an absolute liar. Actually suggested that he'd done quite a lot of Mozart's little arias. And I wanted to call the book Composing for Mozart, a uh, life of William Beckford, and of course the publisher wouldn't allow that. It had to be a life of William Beckford, composing for Mozart. But you know non puy and dry, don't you? Da, 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 Beckford claimed he'd actually done that, and not Mozart, but there we are. Um, with William Kent, it's quite difficult to pin him down. It's not difficult to pin him down in terms of landscape gardening, which is what we're here to look at today, but it's very difficult to pin him down in terms of his character, because he left very few letters, and those letters that we have got are generally begging for money from Italy. Um, so it's very, very difficult to get his character um, dealt with. Anyway, let's... Yeah. Um, some of the slides in this presentation have got uh, quotes, which I will read out. Not all of them have, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, this is William Kent by Benedetto Luti, very heavy, jowly Kent, still in Italy in 1718 before he comes back to England. Um, and I love this Thomas Robinson quote. Robinson, nasty piece of work. Um, Yorkshireman, uh, dangerous person, Robinson. The signor, as he was called, often gave his orders when he was full of claret, which from the context could hardly have been at the dinner table. So off I go to Old, old Town. I go to Bridlington, and I find this rather interesting late 17th century facade on one of the earlier houses. Um, and if you forget everything you hear tonight, don't forget this. Always trespass, 
and always going round the back of buildings because that's where you find excitements. So I went round the back of this building through a little alleyway and I found the date stone that his father had put up. Can you see it's W-E, C-W-E and a little heart and that's William Kant and his wife and a heart to show how together they were that he had done this facade in the 1690s. And then I looked down and looking down I saw this in the courtyard. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that's Kent. Now, you see, the whole point about being a biographer is you have to capture your subject. And I found it very difficult to capture Kent because of all of these rather odd letters that were written in bits of Italian and bits of English. Um, he, he had terrible dyslexia. There's no doubt about it, he was dyslexic. Um, and I looked at this, and a woman came out of the door, and she said, ooh, you like my name then, do you? And I said, yes, it's a wonderful name. And I said, it reminds me of William Kent. And she said, ooh, who's he then? I said, well, he lived in your house. Oh, did he? That man Kant? And I said, yes. I said, but when he went to London, he felt he had to be a little bit hoity-toity, and so changed his name to Kent. Oh, right. So we had this lovely chat. And then I started to look at William Kent's staffage, and there was the key to the man's mind. You only had to look at these wonderful drawings, most of them done in sepia, as you can see, for the garden buildings that he was designing for various people. On your right is um, one of the Chiswick designs for the obelisk and the gate in, in the gardens at Chiswick. And if you look very carefully, you can see that there is a man that's lolling in a drunken stupor, because of course it's midnight, and he has a pallet by him and there are rabbits dancing in a circle. That's Kent, okay? Are you getting him? It gets better, watch this. This is more Kent Staffage. It's great to have it up here, you can all see it, can't you? Who's got the popcorn? <laughs> On your top left, it's, you've got to work out who he is. And of course, nobody had actually worked out until I did this, this book, who Kent was in all these, and suggest therefore an all-day intake of alcohol. And he did not perhaps see the work for several months after. He had indeed a pretty concise, though arbitrary, manner to set all right. For he would order, without consulting his employers, three or four hundred pounds of work or more to be pulled down and then correct the plan and bring it to what it ought to have been at first. And this is absolutely typical of Kent. He's drunk a lot of the time. He's not quite sure in terms of architecture what he's doing and then goes into a fit of peak and wants to rebuild things. Um, we ought to give you a little bit about his history first. Um, one of the best books to have been written in the last 10 years is by Fiona McCarthy, and that's the biography of William Morris. I don't know if any of you have read it. Um, and the first thing that she says in that book, which is very much what I believe in, she says that you have to go to places to find the people. And I've had a wonderful tour of the house here with Pamela, um, thinking about all the people that have been in this house and have made this house what it is. Um, and so I thought, I've got to go to Bridlington. I'm going to switch sides, and I'll come back to you, don't worry. Um, but I like switching sides. Uh, oh, yes, coalition government, isn't it? Um, and I thought, I'm going to have a fun time in Bridlington. This is what research should be. And I am going to stay over, and I'll have a lovely time. So anyway, I go to Bridlington thinking, it's a lovely place on the East Riding Coast, and I'll have a great time. It's an absolute hellhole. Have you ever been to Bridlington? Goodness me. I've never seen so many shell suits in my life. Oh, dear. But Bridlington Old Town is wonderful. And that, of course, is where... William Kent grew up. His father, William Kant, C-A-N-T, um, lived in Bridlington Old Town, and this is where he probably went to school, at the Bale, on the left at the Priory Church, and on the right, sorry, the left is the gatehouse of the Bale, where the grammar school was, and on the right is the Priory Church, where I think Kent might have got an inkling of the Gothic. Now, of course, the title of my lecture tonight is Subverting the Palladian, the Gothic urge, the, the eclectic urge. Um, and there are real heroes tonight and real villains. And one of the main villains tonight is Lord Burlington. And we'll come more to that. He's the guy that created a Palladian straitjacket for Kent that Kent was trying desperately to burst out of most of his life. 
Anyway, oh, I've got to go over here, haven't I, because it won't work unless I do that. Yeah. What a place for us to sort of center ourselves as we carry on this conversation that we're hoping to have. And, and I think it, uh, how, this is just what I had in mind. Just what I had in mind. Um, you, some of you already know Professor Mole uh, of the University of Bristol. He's a popular and prolific author and speaker, well known to both garden history scholars and the public. His un although garden history scholars often are part of the public. His ongoing project, Historic Gardens of England, supported by grants from the Levenhulm Trust, is modeled after Sir Nicholas Pevner's Buildings of England. Upon completion, the nationwide project will present historic landscapes and gardens in separate texts, county by county. Ten books have already been published to date. Professor Mole is an engaging speaker with a long-standing interest in the cultural context of designed landscapes the people who designed and lived in what are now considered historic buildings and gardens. We have a, afterwards, a, a, after a Professor Moll's talk, uh, we'll have a question and answer session, and we hope it's as lively as we can make it. Okay? Um, to keep thoughts, though, clear, I'm going to pass these cards around for you to make notes on. And if you'd like, write out questions, and then during the Q&A, we'll have them passed up. Okay? Now, you must be very careful with your questions, because we're being videoed, all right? And I shall have to be very careful with my language, won't I? Um, particularly as quite a few people in the audience have either been taught by me or are being taught by me, and it's lovely to see them. Um, but it's a great privilege for me to be here at Claremont um, in a county that I haven't yet managed to deal with, although Jill Leggett's here in the audience, and we'll probably have a talk about things I could do in Surrey when I'm uh, finished the 34 others or the 33 others. Um, one of the big problems about this Levy Hume project that I'm doing is that um, I started far too late. Uh, Pevsner started in the 51, I think, and he finished England um, in 1974 with Staffordshire. But then, you know, he spent about six weeks doing.